go. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Nations Wall's virtual panel on AI and climate. We have a tremendous and important conversation in store for you today, and we're thrilled that amidst all the things, you prioritize making time to join us. Before we get started, just a few, housekeep just a few housekeeping notes. Today's conversation is being streamed live on YouTube and LinkedIn. The recording will remain available on those platforms. Feel free to share this with your friends and colleagues. We need to all be thinking and talking more about AI and climate change, as well as the intersection of these two topics. So please do help spread word. A very quick introduction. My name is Jason Rissman. I am the Chief Experience Officer at Nationswell and also host the podcast, Invested in Climate. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Nationswell, we are an executive membership network and advisory that works with sustainability, philanthropy, and other impact leaders to help them learn, take bigger bets, and be more successful. We are delighted to host this conversation as one of several ways we are bringing our members together to advance knowledge and connection around climate, AI, and other important timely topics. We were honored earlier this year to be recognized by Fast Company with two world-changing ideas awards related to Nationswell Collaboratives, which are vehicles for helping a group of organizations learn, find opportunities, and accelerate progress on key issues. And we're pleased to share that we're in the process of forming collaboratives, both on AI for social good, as well as on climate justice and resilience. Please let us know if you're interested in partnering on either of those initiatives or if you'd like to learn more about Nationswell membership. Easy to reach out to us just by going to our website, nationswell.com, uh, and going to the Contact Us form. Without further ado, I'd like to thank our expert panelists for joining us and to hand off, today's, uh, hand off to today's moderators, Fast Company Impact Editor, Amy Rollins, and Head of Social Impact at GitHub, Sid Espinoza. Amy and Sid, thanks for being here with us today take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Jason. And thanks to all of you for joining. We're very excited about this conversation. It's going to be lively and engaging and touch on some of the most important issues that we're facing today. So before we all kick in, I'd love to pass it around to all of the um, panelists to give a little 60 second overview, who you are, what you do, and how AI and climate really are impacting your job and how you're thinking about the work you do. Uh, Asim, can I start with you? Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, Asim Hussain, I'm the chairperson and executive director of the Green Software Foundation. And uh, personally, I've been looking at the intersection of software and sustainability for, I think, almost five years now. Um, and when, when I describe it is, the how I describe it is I've been looking at one question, which is how do you build software so it has zero harmful environmental effects? I've been trying to, like, mean number of others at the foundation we're trying to answer that question i'm a software engineer my audience is the growing community of software engineers who want to know how to do their job more sustainably um so my focus on this on this call i should say is kind of a lot less how ai can help the climate and more how ai is a cause of emissions and how to mitigate those that's kind of my focus area um uh, challenges, lots of challenges. My focus area is measurement. It's pretty boring. I'm very boring these days. I talk about measurement all the time. I was mentoring a mentee recently, and I just realized I spent 20 minutes talking about OKRs, and uh, he phased out. But um, that's really what I what I talk, where I focus in. It's something I've been avoiding for years because it's so challenging. But uh, with a lot of things are happening right now, a lot of tectonic movements to make measuring measurement much more possible in the software software sustainability space. Yeah, that's me. Perfect. That's great. Um, Jen, I'll kick it over to you. Thanks, Amy. Uh, Jen Hofstetler at Intel. I look after our product sustainability for the company. And we really have three main parts of our strategy in service to helping our customers lower their footprint. And it's helping to uh, drive down the emissions that are in our foundry, where we're making products for ourselves and third parties in our products, which starts with that silicon. Um, how we're being efficient in the design of the silicon, uh, all the way through the platform and the green chemistries that are needed uh, for those motherboards of the future, but up through the software stack and those layers that Asim talked about. And in partnership, our third uh, mission is to drive standardization and methodologies. So not only around the software accounting, which is critical for AI, 
And as we know, this is the advent of the AI era. So this is a very timely topic of AI and sustainability, but we know it's gonna take a collaboration um, with consortia like the Green Software Foundation and partnership across the ecosystem for us to get to that future uh, where we can truly see a sustainable computing in the future. Fantastic. Scott, how about you? Scott Gigante, I'm a founding engineer um, at Sideline Climate. We're a market intelligence platform tracking uh, everything there is to know about the, the new climate economy. So we follow startups funding commitments across a range of industries, not just energy, energy, but industrials, food and ag, uh, transportation, and, and much, much more. Um, personally, I'm you know, very closely involved in the data collection side of this. So one way that AI is both deeply involved and exciting for me is, you know, this this is a an enormous uh, benefit for us in terms of reducing the human burden of data collection as we watch a fundamental restructuring of the economy um, to get to net zero, um, to adapt to, to the new world that we will live in by hopefully before 2050. Um, but additionally, I've been working in AI uh, for the last 10 years, uh, following with this very closely as a software engineer, as a machine learning scientist. So it's uh, a very interesting uh, development in the last year or so as, as this has hit the mainstream. Um, and I'm very excited to talk about it today. Thank you. All right, and finally, Claudine, kick us off. Hi, everyone. I am Claudine Emiat, and I'm a partner at Salesforce Ventures, where I lead our Salesforce Ventures Impact Fund. We invest across multiple categories, um, including climate tech, which is the area where we've been spending the majority of our time for the last couple of years. And we um, have a number of, of investments in our portfolio that are leveraging AI um, as core elements of their, of their software platforms. Um, Thinking kind of on behalf of my portfolio um, CEOs, which is often where my head is and, and challenges they're facing, I think um, there's a definite war right now for talent <laughs> when it comes to AI and um, they are, you know, in, in the middle of it. Um, thankfully, they have a really strong pull. I think um, there are a lot of engineers who who are attracted to companies that are um you know, solving the greatest challenge that humanity faces today. And so they're generally doing well in terms of attracting um, fantastic AI ML talent, but nonetheless, it, it is hard um, right now in this competitive environment for, for talent. I'm gonna jump in. Let me join Amy in thanking our panelists. I can't think of a better group of people to come together at this moment and talk about such a critical issue. It is, of course, the case that AI is everywhere you turn. Every conference I go to seems to have an AI panel. There seems to be uh, the conversation um, sort of sparking up everywhere you look. But what, But I think at this point, we're really, when it comes to climate, at a critical moment. And Scott, I'm hoping you can help ground us in that moment. I think people are hearing a lot about generative software like ChatGBT. Um, this technology has been around for a while. So why right now? Why in the last year has the conversation around AI and climate fundamentally changed? Um, help ground us in this moment. Absolutely. Yeah. I, as as probably everyone here knows, uh, the, the recent surge in interest really started uh, earlier this year when ChatGPT was made public. Um, this is fundamentally not a shift in technological capabilities, but a shift in what was available. Um, so the, the technology underlying ChatGPT has been on a slow and steady march technologically for the last 10 to 15 years, let's say. Um, neural networks were invented in 1960s, but, but we don't need to go that far back. Um, what's fundamentally changed is that it's become available as a commercial service, as a service that regular people can see and use in their day to day. And so while we're all very excited about and, and sometimes worried about uh, the implications of this latest development, it hasn't quite come at the, at the pace that it has appeared to uh, from the public's perception. You know, this technology up until this year was hidden behind closed doors of, of corporate R&D or, or the opacity of journals. Um, and by putting it on the on the front page in a, you know, a chat bot where everybody can use it, all of a sudden it sort of hit the public consciousness that this is available, it's happening. AI is not uh, uh, sci-fi anymore, but something that's gonna impact our day-to-day -day lives. 
And Scott, I know you've been, you're really interested in sort of the flip side of that and how the pitfalls, the, um, the environmental costs that come with it. Can you, I mean, continue your grounding and just, and talk a little bit about, um, while it's so exciting, it also poses a lot of um, environmental and resource risks. Absolutely. I, I like to think of this as two separate stories. I, I think of AI as a technology, which could be an enormous boon for us. It can you know, help deploy technologies in, in more efficient, and more optimized ways. It can help knowledge workers understand a, a wealth of information um, without having necessarily to read it all. Um, it can it can be used to dig through, you know, uh, gigabytes of satellite data and identify uh, where methane leaks are, are occurring. All, all sorts of very exciting applications. On the flip side, AI as an industry um, is sort of the the downside, I think of this as the, the tech giants who are interested in deploying AI for financial gain, not always with the consequences to society in mind. And that can be cer certain things that are uh, on the on the front pages. Uh, we talk about existential risk, especially with the, the latest developments at OpenAI at the forefront of everybody's minds. But I'm thinking a little bit more about the here and now, not about what could happen in 10, 20, 30 years, but the risks today, not only in, in privacy and in bias and discrimination and security, um, but particularly for us uh, working in climate, just plain and simple, the energy risks. Um, so as an example, if, if we were just to see Google switch over Google search from a classical algorithm that it uses now to rank web, uh, web searches to an AI-based search, uh, the increase in electricity would be something on par with the total annual use of electricity by the Republic of Ireland, uh, which is just an enormous statistic and, and something that should really make us worry and, and concerned um, about that large scale deployment of a technology, especially at the same time as we're already increasing demand on the electric grid through the electrification of, of industry and transportation and the decommissioning at the same time um, of fossil fuel power plants. So that energy use is, is front of mind along with many other immediate risks of deploying a technology that we really don't know a whole lot about yet in terms of its implications on society. Yeah, and that's going to be a theme, I think, that we that threads through a lot of what we talk about um, today. Jen, I know Intel is doing some really interesting work about around data centers, trying to make them more sustainable, more energy efficient. Mm -hmm. Would love to hear a little bit about what you're implementing there, how you're, what you're seeing kind of in um, just the industry writ large in terms of Kind of combating that, mitigating those issues. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, to build upon, you know, what Scott was saying there, I this has been an ongoing trend. I think even up until this moment, we were starting to see data centers um, constrained on power and the availability that they could get locally, um, because it's a very long time to put in transmission lines or or new generation facilities. Um, so really, that focus on energy efficiency has been top of mind for a while. Uh, there's there's many different ways that we look at tackling this challenge um, throughout the products, whether it's in a laptop, um, a network device, or in the cloud itself for those servers. And you know, a lot of that comes through the use of AI and telemetry on the platforms. How we can look ahead monitor the use. Um, you know, we have customers, for example, uh, that in China, where they're monitoring the network traffic of a 5G system. And none of us, we're all users of the, the, the telecommunications network. We don't want it to go down. But if it can be more energy efficient and deliver that same SLA, that's really what the customers are looking for. So we're trying to build solutions um, in that case, it's the infrastructure power manager that we have. And when we can, putting solutions into open source um, for power where scheduling, et cetera. Um, those are some of the, the first and, and foremost things that we look to do within our own data centers, of course, but also for every enterprise on the planet that we're helping um, to optimize their infrastructure solutions. Um, when you do that, that's going to also scale to the AI systems uh, that will be coming online even more in the next few years. Um, the, the last piece that we really look at 
um, as always, you of course need to increase the energy efficiency of the product. I'll save a topic for uh, ASM around the tight coupling of software to hardware, because if there's transistors that have been built, it took energy to build them. Um, they're consuming energy if they're sitting out there and you really need to make sure that your software is well utilizing every attribute accelerators that are built in um, to get the greatest efficiency out of that. And we partner uh, with different AI frameworks to help build tools and libraries so that you can really just with a single line of code change, access and take advantage of at least for our parts, some of that integrated AI acceleration that we already have pervasive across the globe built into uh, the server processors, the Xeon processors. Um, on top of all of that, when you step back and you think about the explosion that is going to happen with broader deployment at enterprises, more in the cloud, um, at new, new customers that are popping up every day, to be able to service this increased demand um, for these AI solutions, um, we're seeing that they're all going to be starting with renewable first, um, with sustainable you know, solutions in mind. And that includes something that's a little bit counterintuitive, um, uh, liquid cooling for these systems. So they're running so hot um, and they're going to be on, and in some cases, 24 seven, depending on you know, how, how fully booked these uh, different systems are. And so we're really working with the ecosystem to invest in standards, as I was talking about, uh, around material compatibility uh, for different liquid cooling solutions and to figure out how we can accelerate the adoption of these solutions because they can save up to 30% of the energy consumed in the infrastructure. So we're really looking soup to nuts. How do you you know, from silicon all the way to the data center level solutions, uh, lower the energy efficiency, um, or excuse me, lower the energy consumption of those AI solutions. Claudine, I'd love to shift to you. Just as we're hearing Jen talk about some of these future technologies and the innovation needs to happen, you've obviously been spending, I, I believe it's six years ago that you started the um, impact investing um, focus there at, at um at Salesforce's venture fund. And I just wonder sort of, as you're looking at cases, as you're looking at the potential for what sort of that intersection of, of tech and innovation, uh, climate, AI, um, you know, what are, what are you looking for right now? What are you seeing as that potential, both in the short term and in the longer term? Well, the, sh the short answer is that I think that there's a lot of excitement, um, you know, whether it's turning big data into actionable information, optimizing complex systems or just accelerating scientific progress more generally. I think the opportunities, um, you know, to improve our our, our planet's um, future are, are really big. Um, so some of the clear cases where we see AI um, potentially accelerating, if not already accelerating progress are, are in energy. So predicting when electricity demand will be high or low and when renewable energy sources are available. Um, there are lots of different important and really important applications for, for this, um, whether it's just managing the grid more efficiently or um, in, in the example of one of our portfolio companies, WeaveGrid, helping utilities manage the influx of EVs on the grid and ensuring that they are charging in optimal times when electricity is both cheapest, but also importantly, cleanest. Um, we see this uh, play out in the battery space. So batteries are, you know, going, are, are already a huge part of the energy transition. They're going to be even more so. Um, and so, you know, using AI and ML for battery optimization, um, there's a company called Zatara that, that is doing this. Um, and then I think efficiency for back office operations is, is another huge category. So when it comes to meeting climate commitments um, and regulations, there's a whole you know group of companies that are that are using AI, um, whether it's in carbon accounting or, or in other areas, um, to essentially make these back office operations much more efficient and and, and importantly accurate. Um, I think supply chain monitoring is another area. Um, Altan is a company that's really interesting in this space, and then weather and environment. Um, a bunch of companies here, some some using satellites um, like Tomorrow.io. 
But th there's so many different ways that we see AI significantly accelerating um, progress when it comes to um, our planet's our planet's health. And as you look at kind of your portfolio companies or other companies you've um, investigated in this space, are there um, common threads throughout them that, you know, other people who are interested in working in this space or potentially starting a company like might, might learn from some of their best practices or how they're addressing these issues? Yeah, I think, um, you know, um, I'll give an example of a company just, just to ground um, the conversation. And we invested earlier this year in a company called Pano AI, uh, which is working in the early wildfire detection space. Um, so they've integrated um, a small off-the-shelf hardware component with their proprietary software and AI to be able to detect whether a wisp um, in the camera visual is indeed the start of a wildfire or if it's just fog. Um, and importantly, early detection for wildfires is like early detection for cancer. The faster you can you can identify it and then immediately address it, then the the you know, long term risk of something blowing out of proportion um, is significantly minimized. And Pano sells to multiple stakeholders. So they sell to uh, utilities, they sell to um, local fire agencies, they also sell to large private landowners like um, ski resorts, for example. And I think that points to this notion of um, a multi-stakeholder approach. Um, you know, a lot of the companies that we're working with, um, you know, they're they're working with different entities, whether it's public sector or utilities um, or or large you know, private enterprises or public enterprises. But I think that um, when it comes to solving climate, um, we do need, we need every, everyone working together. And um, I think solutions that are involving different stakeholders effectively um, are, are going to be most, more successful. Um, I already mentioned talent, you know, like it, it is, it is really critical that, you know, these companies are able to attract the best talent. Um, and, and I'm excited about what we're seeing on that front, um, capital. So, um, you know, whether it's compute power, um, for generative AI, and, and we can talk again, uh, you know, about the, the flip side, um, risk in terms of, um, implications for emissions there. But, um, you know, the reality is if you're, if you're, if you're deploying LLMs, like the, the compute power and the capital to to power that um is is intensive um and then finally just you know quality quality of data so you know we need to ensure that we have accurate and comprehensive data for training ai models access to high quality data sets um so these are some of the things that i that i think our our, our companies are are doing but also like you know kind of wrestling with um at the moment yeah, I love that. I, just looking ahead, Asim, I'd love to pull you into the conversation here. Uh, let me give a little disclosure that we at GitHub are actively involved, um, as is Microsoft, our parent company, in the Green Software Foundation. And I've been able to see uh, firsthand the leadership um, of your organization, of you, frankly, and getting the industry across the board. I mean, it's not just, you know, it's multiple companies really stepping into this space um, in a way that I think will be transformative for the world. And so I just wonder, as you're looking ahead, as you're thinking of, about what's next um, in this discussion, um, you know, what's critical for people who are on this call, who, who are interested in this space, that intersection of technology and climate to be thinking about, to be kind of grounding themselves in, well, what's top of mind for you? What's keeping you up at night? Oh. <laughs> What's keeping me up at night? <laughs> but in terms of, uh, in terms of, I, th I think there's a couple of areas we can, we, we I can talk about in there. So, um, yeah, in terms of, in terms of that, 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 that question, I'd say for me, it, it's again measurement. Um, I talk about measurement all the time. That might be my, might be my answer to a lot of questions. So, and and I think one of the things that that's come up very recently is, you know, this. Clarific, and this is what this is the conversations that are happening inside the Green Software Foundation with people who are like a small set of people at the cutting edge of, of answering these questions. Is this idea that that there's different types of measurement, and I think that's something that that is really important. There's a term that was quoted in a meeting, and then it was called measurement for reporting versus measurement for action. Mm. And as soon as that was said in the meeting, everybody just kind of like stopped for a moment and said, "That's actually what we've been struggling with," you know. Um, like when you're measuring something, you're really asking a question. It's focused on a particular audience. 
And so if you're doing, uh, as you often all are doing, we're doing measurement, we're doing GHG calculations, we're trying to measure kind of the impact of AI. You, If you're doing measurement from a reporting perspective, you're really trying to answer this question, what number can I defend? And for reporting this to regulatory authorities, what can I defend? Whereas a, a lot of the conversation that's happening now at the kind of coal face is more what number drives actions? What number, what methodology drives behavioral change to actually you know, reduce and eliminate emissions? And I'm, I'm very excited about that discussion that's happening because, um, you know, although I think it's very, I don't want to throw shade on kind of report, I think it's very important, it's very important for us to know how much is GitHub's emissions? How much is Microsoft's emissions? We need to know these questions. But I, what's, what I'm finding very interesting is, is, is the conversations evolving to the point of, well, does that drive action? What action does that drive? Is that the action we want to drive? Um, like, for instance, we developed in the, in the Green Software Foundation, we developed uh, a, a, another measurement methodology called the Software Carbon Intensity Specification, which is built by developers. And it really, like, it's very interesting how that's been developed because it, it actually asks different questions. So for instance, like uh, there's a lot of resistance against double counting with a lot of ways how people measure carbon emissions. And there's a reason for that. We don't allow double counting in accounting. We allow double counting. We encourage double counting in the SCI because the more, the more, if it's, if there's, if you've got double counting, what, what another way of looking at that is that there's actually two people, two organizations incentivized to reduce those emissions. So very interesting, because it, and it, but it doesn't work from a re regulatory report perspective, but it works from an action perspective. Um, and like, for another another aspect of it is 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 market based reporting. You know, the only way for the SCA, the only way to reduce your score is to eliminate emissions. Like, if you include market based reporting, you're incentivizing a slightly different action you're incentivizing the purchasing of renewable energy if you disallow market-based reporting you're incentivizing building uh ai that actually consumes less emissions uh, cons uh consumes less energy so i think for me that's kind of like where i'm seeing and i'm and i'm and i know i'm kind of nerdy i'm kind of at this cutting edge of this cutting edge talking to like 10 people in the world about this very nerdy topic but this is where i i'm very excited to to kind of see this conversation evolving and i see a future where like look we don't run organizations with one metric profit like your department just maximize profit we have like dozens of okrs and metrics every single team and that's the way i think i i'm seeing kind of this future evolve like ai needs a method of measuring ai that incentivizes the kinds of reductions and the mm. kinds of actions that actually reduce ai's emissions and i think that's that's an interesting space like claudine you were even talking about you know energy and kind of like um uh you know we can measure in a way which we incentivize AI to be run using lower carbon sources of energy. And that will incent, we might not re reduce the energy consumption, but at the very least, that energy that's consumed will be lower carbon. So that, that's kind of like where I'm thinking and I'm, and I'm seeing a lot of the kind of edge conversations happening in this space. I can't, let me follow up on that because I, you know, I, I have a background in policy and politics, as some folks know, and we, um, so it's so often, and I was just on a, on a panel where we were talking about ethics and AI and Scott, I wonder if we could come back to you and just dig into that a little bit, because I think building off of what seems talking about so much of, you know, so often the goal to really see uh, systemic and sustained change um, comes through policy, comes through sort of grounding ourselves in what we're measuring and, and and how we regulate that. And so I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about the ethics, the regulation, the policy, sort of what's needed, where where we might be going, what we're thinking about in that space. Yeah, I I think I think I'm going to come back to a sort of two uh, two sided coin again. Um, on the one hand, I would argue that we do have an ethical obligation, sort of a, a duty of care as leaders in climate to to use AI, um, to take advantage of this incredibly powerful tool that we have. You know, at, at Sightline Climate, we're tracking startups across the entire climate ecosystem. We already see over 100 startups in climate whose core product offering uses AI. And that's not to mention the many hundreds of startups who are using AI 
in, in their day-to-day -day operations, maybe not as their core product or technology, but to make their lives easier. You know, we, we do that ourselves. Um, in in sorting through you know corporate documents, filings, all all these uh, public information that is hard to comprehend that we want to boil down to a simple you know series of bullet points that a strategist or an investor can understand. Um, that's all using AI, and I think we have an obligation to do so in order to speed up uh, our deployment of climate solutions towards net zero. Um, but we also have an obligation to consider the harms. Um, and again, leaving aside the sort of killer robots existential risk question, um, we have to think about risks to privacy, risks of bias and discrimination, risks of concentration of, of AI in the hands of a select few uh, tech giants, um, and risks of alignment, uh, the alignment problem being when the incentives of an AI system or the incentives provided, programmed into that AI system are mismatched with our incentives as a society. Um, and we might argue that, you know, the incentives of, of private industry are already misaligned with the incentives of society at times. And that's true. But when the incentives of private industry are misaligned with society, there's a human in the middle whose job it is to press that big red button and might think about the moral or legal implications of what they're doing, the implications on, you know, carbon emissions, the implications on the welfare of, of low income communities uh, who are affected by their corporate decision. And AI systems have no such restraint. Um, so exactly how to regulate those systems is, is challenging. It's you know a difficult space for governments to move in when a technology is evolving so rapidly. Um, but if we compare AI to other high risk fields to society involving technical experts, think engineering, healthcare, law, um, all of these professions are bound by technical codes or professional responsibility. Um, and as of now, AI developers and users have no such code of conduct. So personally, I'd love to see a code of conduct for AI software developers and AI practitioners, users of these technologies um, with legal liability for the actions taken by the AI system that they're deploying, as well as you know a, a professional licensing scheme and whistleblower protection to make sure that people can call out when these tools are being used in uh, unethical or irresponsible manners. Um, and, you know, it's it's nice to think that that might happen, but it's going to take a long time to get there. And, and we as, as private actors and, you know, leaders in the industry have an obligation in the meantime, think about how we can adopt a voluntary codes of conduct um, and, and take on board some of these ethical obligations while we wait uh, and provide input, expert input to uh, government processes to, to reach a uh, uh, you know, whether it be federal, local, uh, intergovernmental agreement. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'd love to switch gears just a little bit. We've been talking a lot about the macro, um, kind of the regulatory and policy and um, big picture stuff about AI, but I'd love to bring it down to the micro. Um, both AI and climate, I think, can be really kind of heady and feel out of the daily experience of many people's lives who aren't actively involved in this, but are, you know, interested or concerned. Um, so it'd be great to talk a little bit about, you know, what are some examples of how AI and used in climate might um, now or in the near future begin to make an impact in people's daily lives or, you know, um, lives in general. Claudine, you mentioned wildfire and Pano, um, as well as EV charging. I think those are really great examples, but I'd love to open it up to all four of you if there are, you know, startups or even just ideas that, you know, people are working on that um, have a lot of potential to improve, you know, people's lives. Yeah, I, I want to share um, a story, and I can't remember the name of the company, um, but when I was at Climate Week in New York, I think, you know, in general, there's this worry, uh, and Claudine, you talked a lot about the talent pool, and do we have the right talent pool to go after, you know, all the needs in climate tech, and what this, um, this company owner discussed is his company is to help all the buildings in New York City lower their carbon emissions. But to do that, he needed a very technical workforce to be able to understand and like, you know, train to a certain level of engineering uh, and to recommend the path for reducing those emissions, for analyzing all the data that exists publicly, et cetera. Um, what they've been able to do by implementing an 
AI solution is they've actually been able to scale their workforce because they're now able to, you know, bring more people on board and address more of the buildings in New York City, whereas before they were limited by the number of their workforce. So I think we should, you know, it's really an opportunity for everyone to open their minds. I don't know that every person needs to be an AI uh, specialist, <laughs> if you will, um, but how are we using the tools that are being built as well uh, to accelerate, you know, the upskilling of a workforce, the expansion to be able to tackle these problems? Because I think there are a lot of solutions, but now how do we use them to scale uh, to address the global emissions? Hey, Jen, can I just follow up on that? I, I We will not be able to. Let me acknowledge first, because in about uh, a little more than five minutes, we'll switch over to questions that came in from the audience. A phenomenal list of questions. I mean, we could spend a couple more hours diving through those. Um, but one of them that I noted was somebody saying, I'm a recent CS grad. I'm really interested in entering the space. What should I be thinking about? Like, what skills do I need? Where do I where do I start? What do I do? And I just wonder if you have advice sort of building off of what you were just saying. Not everybody needs to be an expert in this space, but, um, you know, what advice might we give? And I open that up to anybody, if, uh, you know, advice we would give to people wanting to to dive in. Yeah, I would just say certainly those that are trained in software to expand their domain uh, in AI techniques and how to utilize the tools. And then, you know, I, I'm going to put out some plugs out there around model optimization. Everything doesn't need to be these ginormous large language models. And so there's going to be an incredible need for uh, different enterprises to orchestrate various models. Um, so really starting to understand those differences, um, what is like, what does model compression look like? Uh, you know, we've, we've done some examples that we've uh, at Intel posted publicly um, with an Intel neural compressor um, and Q8 chat. So starting to familiarize yourself with those tools and what the most sustainable implementation would be as well as uh, learning a little bit more from the Green Software Foundation. I think you know those would be the areas of investment I would recommend um, to folks that are new to this space. Great. And just, and just I just might jump in. Bit. Oh, go on. Go on, Scott. No, go off. Go for it. Go for it. Now, I was going to quickly say, just, just I was going to uh, thank you, Jen, for the plug. And I'm just going to give the URL for that plug. So there's, there's a website called learn.greensoftware.foundation, which is a very short two hour. And, and this is not for AI. This is like, if you just want to understand some of the terminology we're talking about today, why are we talking about energy? Why are we talking about demand response and energy grid? Like, if you want to like learn some of that stuff and understand, um, so you could just start using the same language. And then when you learn the AI and, and the AI work, you, you'll then be able to understand how do I do this work more sustainably? So there's, there's a quick two hour training there if you want to grab it. Give it to us one more time learn.greensoftware.foundation. Great. Scott. That's you... fantastic. Um, I was just going to jump in and speak as a, as a CS grad myself and an AI scientist. Um, most people trained in AI are not actually building models most of the time. Unless you're working at, you know, there are two or three companies really building the big models. Most of the time that we spend developing AI is really collecting data sets, understanding use cases, tinkering with the outputs and making sure that they fit with the needs of the product. And so even if if you're interested in using AI, but don't necessarily want to get into weeds of you know, model development and model optimization, I would encourage you to think about where do we have a large amount of data that can be used to solve the problem? Um, and some great examples there across, you know, industrial optimization, across satellite imagery analysis. Uh, there are just an enormous multitude of places where these tools can be used with relatively little technical modification to the models, but instead thinking about where can we take these tools and make our existing processes more efficient, more accurate, more optimized. Claudine, if I can switch over to you, uh, going back to the examples that you gave, and as we're talking about builders of this field, another one of the questions that was in in the comments there was for startups. I mean, what's needed? What you know, where where do they go to find support? Just give us a sense of like that landscape, and 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 what's again for these builders, what's really needed right now? What are we seeing as sort of the the gaps? 
I think, um, you know, I've already, I've already touched on, on a few, um, but, uh, you know, one I haven't pulled on yet is I, I think the, the public private partnership piece, right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we had the most, um, the most lucrative um, landmark uh, climate funding um, legislation passed with the IRA. And um, the reality is it's, it's slow going in terms of, in terms of accessing those dollars. And um, I think we, we just need as much as possible, really tight coordination between the public and private sector on, on that front um, because it, it is, it is transformative legislation and, um, the dollars allocated, um, you know, when when actually multiplied through the tax code, are are far are far higher than the kind of initial um, budget leads, you know, uh, leads us to believe. And so, but we need to actually we need to we need to execute <laughs> on it. And a lot of companies are are still trying to figure out exactly how to navigate that. That's great. We're like, like Sid said, we're going to kick it to Q and a in just two minutes, but before we do, we'd love to do just a rapid fire, you know, 30, 45 seconds to each of you. What is a breakthrough, a startup, a person, something you're really excited about could be within your own work or just that you're seeing elsewhere in the space. Um, again, like to my earlier question, you can tell where my interest lies. If it's something that, you know, has the potential to really impact people on sort of their, their life level, that's great. But, you know, you can think more broadly also. Um, Claudine, you're still on my screen. So I'm going to, I'm going to go to you first. Great. Um, I've been spending some time recently with an early stage company called Amini AI, which is bringing, um, AI and, and data to um, a region that has um, largely been known for its scarcity of high quality data, and that's Africa. Um, Africa still has a huge percentage of the world's arable land. It also has a massive per percentage relative to the entire population of smallholder farmers. Um, and it is really essential that we get better, more granular data um, both to those farmers, so they can make better decisions about farming practices, agricultural inputs, um, how to how to manage increasingly um, different and um, unusual weather patterns, et cetera. Um, and so that that really you know answers that question of what's what's the you know real life human impact of AI. Like the, there there's a real use case there. Um, but also importantly to other stakeholders in this region, insurers, you know, we, um, Aon is a massive uh, company that actually pulled out of the region a few years ago because it didn't have enough credible data. And because of this company, Amini is actually back in the region. Um, this is an incredible story. And, and it's been, it's because this company is, is, you know, realized there was, there was a dearth of data um, and an AI and ML analysis on it to be able to get it into the hands of people up and down the, um, the value chain and um, across the African continent. Scott, you want to jump in? Absolutely. Claudine, that's a great story. Um, I don't have quite so specific a story, but a, a technology or an approach that really excites me. Um, I'm really interested in industrial optimization, um, and in particular, hearing a lot about digital twins. So this is a technology that's been around for about 10 or 15 years, but with generative AI, it's become much more at the forefront. And the idea is that alongside a physical asset, think maybe a chemical manufacturing plant, you maintain a digital copy of that plant. Uh, and so then any changes you make, any any modifications, any experimentation can be done on the digital version of, of the plant or the asset before you actually implement those in the real world. Um, and with generative AI, we can make these digital twins much more accurate simulations of the real thing. And this means that we can you know, experiment much more easily, much more quickly and much more accurately in order to understand you know, what is the best way to run this physical asset and make sure we squeeze out you know, every last, every last drop of electricity, every last use of the resource um, in the physical world by experimenting in, in the digital twin. And I think for me, this, it reminds me that AI is not, you know, a panacea of its own. It's not going to cure cancer or suddenly uh, enable nuclear fusion power, or at least I don't think it will, uh, but it will make us better at the things we're already doing. Um, and that I sort of, take as my guiding principle for the application of AI climate. Yeah, excuse me, that's great. Asim? 
Um, yeah, I'm going to pick another uh, a broad technology, which is a, a carbon aware computing. So carbon aware computing is this is this, I think it's, I might have touched on it before, which is doing more when electricity is clean and doing less when it's dirty. And it's it's a really interesting area. And there's a lot of organizations like Microsoft done some work, Google, Apple, uh, all the all the big uh, organizations. And one of the one of the reasons why a lot of organizations are excited about this is because. It doesn't require a huge amount of effort. You're not re-architecting your entire system. You're just deciding when and where to run it. And the really interesting, there's there's very few types of compute you could run that with. Like we couldn't run, we couldn't suddenly move this Zoom call to, to France with nuclear energy. Like we just couldn't. But with AI, because of the length, how long it takes to train, um, a, there is the opportunity there to, to mitigate that, to run it at times, which is uh, with using cleaner energy. And we've seen stuff like that. UBS did a, a great piece of work with that with Microsoft last year using something what well, we built. So that's like a really interesting technology. And another thing I really like about that technology is if you think about it, um, if you're if you're building software which does more when you know there's more clean electricity, you're you're really building software which is responding to the natural cycles of the earth. And I really love that. You're building software which does more when the this is what we do as farmers. You don't just go out and like farm at night. Like you 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 take advantage of summer. Like as developers, like we would then go, oh, it's sunny now. I'm going to make my software do more because it's sunny. I'm going to respond uh, to the natural cycles of the earth. And I, and I find that we're so distant away from nature as engineers. It's a way of almost connecting you to nature. Just another level of how I look at it. But yeah, carbon work can be. I love that. Um, all right, Jen, final. You're the last one on here. What do you say? Yeah, I I am really passionate, uh, like Scott, about how do we get more out of the resources that are already deployed. So I love I love Asim having a, a bio rhythm almost with the the earth. That's wonderful and the sun, um, but also solutions. And there's startups out there. We have in our own investment um, programs. Uh, that are looking at removing the waste and back to that that coupling of the software and the silicon, you know, or your server system. And there's examples of companies out there that are able to demonstrate 20, 30 percent efficiency gains uh, without losing performance. And, you know, I think solutions like that, when I think about the solutions I get excited about, they're scalable. Right, Intel's got a solution called Granulate. We we help customers with um, their cloud instances to be more efficient, right? To get the same work done, but be more efficient. It's a, a small use case of AI where it's again monitoring your use and how you could be more efficient. Um, everything doesn't have to be at that very large language model. So anything that we can do um, to build or accelerate those scale solutions that help, you know, more people around the globe to get more efficient use of these resources that have been deployed. I think that's what excites me most. And there's there's a lot of promising um, additional work going on in that area. It's immediately effective. Switching, oh, thank you so much, everybody. And thank, switching over to the, the list of questions, you know, what was really interesting to me is as I paged through them, they really varied in terms of sector often asking what should the sector do? But the question would be, what should the federal government do? Is that where we're gonna see the innovation? There are questions about startups, right? Like, is that where we should be investing with the startups? Is it the NGOs? Or is it like at the local level? Is it the large companies? I mean, sort of where should we focus? Everybody, um, you know, this, where do we have the biggest impact? It's so often the question when it comes to these, but you saw these different questions about sectors. and. Um, and I just wonder, you know, if, uh, a round of sort of where you think that opportunity is or where do we really need to focus? And it's all, it's never one thing. Obviously, it's like we need to come at it at all these different angles. But I just wonder sort of where you think, you know, in, in, in the immediate term, um, the opportunity is. And is there something in particular? Is there something that the federal government should be focusing on? Is it something that with NGOs or a certain sector we should be um you know, focusing our attention on. I'm happy to jump in here. Um, I think a lot about the, in terms of reducing the energy consumption of AI in particular, 
Um, the training piece we've talked about a little bit, carbon-aware computing is a, a great example of you know, moving AI training to a lower emission uh, time or place. But the part I think that is a little bit underemphasized is AI inference. So training ChatGPT, uh, an estimate says, costs about a gigawatt hour of electricity, but using it every day with people all around the world is costing about 250 megawatt hours each day. Um, and so as we move to deploying AI at the edge, on the on your on your cell phone, um, on servers all around the world, live every day, you know, there's probably AI touching up my video right now um, that can't be moved to a more efficient time or place because it has to happen right now. And so thinking about how do we optimize the energy use of AI inference um, so that everyday applications of AI use the less electricity, I think it's a really interesting place where, you know, the large data centers, the, the AI tech giants are really incentivized to minimize their training costs, but the inference costs fall a lot to startups small businesses, everyday users. And that's something that I think is underemphasized at this point. I think I think maybe I'll I'll offer I'll offer some thoughts as well in a in a, in a slightly uh, more of a rubric that I use as as, as well to kind of decide some of this stuff. So like and I, because I really get it because oftentimes like, I, I get challenged as well because I'm focusing on, you know, the emissions of the tech sector. And, you know, we depending on which study you look at, it's between two and four percent. And then, you know, like, why are you bothering with the tech sector at all? It's only two to four percent. Um, and I say this is really it's really it's the and, I, and I, I think the argument for that is the same argument for AI. Why focus on AI when it's only a sub small percentage of that two to four percent? Really, there's two things to think about, and that is growth. And ease of decarbonization. The reason we're focusing on technology is if it's some reports say that if we do nothing other than more than what we're doing, by 2040, we'll be 14% of, of global emissions. So we should do something now to kind of flatten out that curve. And the, the best time to invest, the cheapest time to invest is now rather than 2040 when we are at 14%. So I think focus on, on growth areas is why we should focus on tech and why we should focus on AI because it's growing. Uh, now is going to be the easiest time we have to decarbonize AI, AI is now. And the other one is ease of decarbonization. Oftentimes get people going, well, why why focus on on, on concrete? Concrete seven percent. I'm not going to change, I'm going to turn into a concrete engineer overnight. But like, so and and I think that the way people there's a ranking of percentage of of global emissions, and that's how we rank importance. I say no, you rank importance by ease of decarbonization. What is easy to decarbonize? Like Jen was like touching on only one. She listed a whole bunch of mechanisms for decarbonizing that we already know about. We don't need to invent. We just need to deploy. So like tech is an area where there is, it might not be the biggest emissions right now, but we it's a growth area and we know how to decarbonize it. AI, it might not be the biggest area right now, but it's huge in terms of growth. And we know, somewhat know how to decarbonize it. And I think if you take that rubric, Sid, and apply it to kind of like other areas, that's how I oftentimes think things. Is it a, if, if it's a growth area, pay attention. Is it easy to, do, to decarbonize? Prioritize it. So that's kind of how I think about things. Super helpful. I like that. Um, so building upon that, just as you were asking that question, Sid, I was thinking, is that something we haven't talked a lot about? And I was thinking about when, Scott, you were talking about the ethics question is, the consumer behavior, right? Yeah. And their choice and their knowledge. And so something that we haven't talked about today that I think uh, could be something for governments to look into is almost like that nutrition label for what am I consuming so mm -hmm. that you can make an informed choice. It's very hard to educate billions of people <laughs> without the information, um, but that'll of course take some of the standards, the methodologies that the Green Software Foundation is picking up at then to put it into policy so that individuals can have an informed choice because absent that standardization, even today we're seeing um, black boxes where people are giving you the carbon footprint of your usage and, and they're, they're, it's not transparent. They're not you know equivalently measuring it and they're not giving the consumer any tools to modulate their consumption. Um, so I really think if there's one thing that if I could wave a wand and, and see the policymakers do, that would be it. And then that would accelerate uh, the alignment on the standards uh, to get there. 
Claudine, I'm going to switch you to our last question where we're getting to the last couple of minutes of our routine and Nation Swell always in these forums um, ends with the call to action, something that you want people to take away or go do. Um, you know, this audience is is varied, uh, obviously people passionate or interested in this issue. Um, but from your perspective, what is that what is that call to action for people on this call? Um, I'm actually going to go back to um, a question from earlier about the the recent CS grad is trying to figure out, okay, so how can I take my great skill set and and mm -hmm. jump into the climate space? And um, I will put a plug in for a company um, called TerraDo, um, which is a great place to both take um, little short virtual courses on climate, um, but also scan tens of thousands of jobs in climate. Um, and I noticed that they have a particular track around software stacks and climate tech. So this is a call to action both to that um, participant, but perhaps more generally, um, there are people in this um, in this group who would be interested in their programming. I, I've heard great things about it from people who've taken their courses. Awesome. Others, call to action? I, I actually, not know Tara do that. They just want to mirror. I think they're, they're, they're a great organization. Um, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll mention one thing. So um, I, before working on uh, uh, Green Software Foundation, I was a co-organizer of another community called climateaction.tech. And again, if you are like, if you are that CS grad and just trying to connect, and this is, it's, it's not what my field. It's if you're in technology and you care about climate in any capacity, it's a really good community to join just to connect with others. Now we say that's the most important thing is just to connect with others. And I'll probably just put another dig for that learn.green software foundation because that's uh, I always I always point people that as the first place to, to learn. I'll jump in here with a pivot from the grad to the executive. Uh, my call to action is, is a return to the ethics piece to say, you know, if you're in a, a leadership position at any organization that is developing or using artificial intelligence, I'd love to see you develop and implement a code of conduct uh, for your internal use of AI. Um, and that, you know, covers everything from bias and discrimination all the way through to carbon emissions and electricity use. Um, there's some great examples, um, not only from international organizations like G7, but also I believe Salesforce has an AI code of conduct on their website. Uh, so shout out there. Um, and I think we would really benefit as uh, an industry to have more examples of those. Jen, 30 seconds, close this out. Um, find scale solutions and deploy them today. So you can definitely get more out of whatever is being deployed. And you know, just echoing what Scott said, um, consider the externalities of all of your decisions if you're a developer um, or hardware engineer or beyond. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. You all are wonderful and you're doing such important work. Um, I'm personally excited to track it write stories about it and um, keep up with everything you're doing there. Um, and thanks to everyone on the call. Really appreciate you tuning in. Um, just as a reminder, the videos will be up on LinkedIn and YouTube after um, the event. And I believe there will also be an email going out with some resources that were discussed. So thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks everybody. Happy holidays.